All right, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon Ng. I am a senior this year, and today I'd like to talk to you about my research project, which is about MRSA in in our schools. And for this summer research, I only sampled Iolani School. And first things first, I would like to say thank you to Papa Jack for the opportunity that he gives to all of us here in the K Fellowship, and for Doc and Dr. Chan for mentoring me and keeping me on track throughout the summer. So, first. First thing, you might be asking, well, what the heck is um, a, a Staphylococcus aureus? Well, first of all, it is a bacteria that lives naturally in 30% of people's noses, and it's usually not dangerous because in, it can live on your skin, and as long as it doesn't breach the skin barrier, you won't get sick from it, but it's when you do get this, is when it does get past the skin barrier by a cut or like you get it from somebody else, is that when is when you really start to have problems like sepsis and like surgical site infections. And every year, three million people get staph staph infections. And Staphylococcus aureus likes to live in hot temperatures with high humidity. And it also infects people mainly by having contact with infected people or things. Like one common way that a lot of adults get staph inf staph infections is that they like share needles or they like share like a towel or like share towels and then we can move on to what is MRSA and MRSA is methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus and over 119,000 of those 3 million infections I, I mentioned about staph or MRSA infections and only 20,000 of those cases led to death and the problem with MRSA is that it was historically only acquired in hospitals, but now recently, since like the early like 1990s to early 2000s, it started to gain a lot of prevalence. And that just MRSA in general, is that MRSA, there's a problem with MRSA because it is a superbug that cannot be cured with commonly used antibiotics, and that so many people die of these infections because the incubation of MRSA is 1 to 10 days, and most of the time, hospital and clinics will spend a lot of time identifying the infection and then giving you the most common antibiotics. So basically, you walk into the clinic or the hospital, you, they do like a nasal swab, they colonize it, that takes like a day, and then after they come out, oh, it's MRSA, and then they give you like the, the most common antibiotic, and then you come back a couple, like, couple of days later and say, oh, this doesn't work, and they give you another one. And by the time they find out that, by the time they find the right like antibiotic that actually kills the bacteria, you are either dead or you need critical treatment. And today, it is the leading cause of death by infection in the United States. But how are there two different types of MRSA? So the first one is community acquired MRSA, and the second one is healthcare acquired MRSA. And that healthcare acquired MRSA affects older people, like ICU patients, dialysis patients, the like elderly that need to stay in hospitals for long periods of time. While community acquired MRSA usually affects younger people that are usually very healthy, like children, athletes, prisoners, soldiers. And also, as you see on the on the chart over there, Healthcare acquired uh, no healthcare associated MRSA has more antibiotic resistance than community acquired MRSA as shown, and as you as you can see that community acquired MRSA has less antibiotic resistance than healthcare acquired MRSA, and community acquired MRSA is also more deadly than healthcare acquired MRSA due to the presence of something called the P P P V A. PVL toxin, which is Panton Valentine leukocycin, which causes leukocyte destruction and tissue necrosis. And for this research, I'll only be focusing on community acquired MRSA for my research because community acquired MRSA is more prevalent in our country and is now and, and how it has become the leading cause of death in the United States. And the reason why I would target schools in my research is that first of all, there's a lot of contact sports like football, wrestling, soccer, basketball, you name it. And most of the cases have actually found to be started in football and wrestling teams where one person gets it from like maybe like somebody that was in the hospital and it spreads to them. 
and especially like in football or like in wrestling where like you share like the same mat or you share like the same like pads for football and it, it can sh- it can spread from one person to the entire team and and that leads to a lot of community implications because then, then those people that got MRSA wouldn't go out and infect their family unknowingly or just because they share like common stuff like maybe a toothbrush or like a drink or a towels or something. And also schools have like have a really high potential to become like a major outbreak of MRSA due to the fact that there is a high density of people. It, it's basically like having a football team but it's much bigger because then because then those people like let's say if somebody had MRSA and they could like spread it, which they can then if they like touch a doorknob and you had like an open cut on that doorknob then you would get a MRSA infection and then that doorknob will become like a fomite of fomite of MRSA and everybody that touches it can potentially get the infection if they like touch their nose or if they touch like an open cut or something and even though with all this like information you might be asking well why do we care about this and even though in 2017 only 19 people got healthcare associated MRSA, there has been no studies that quantify the amount of community acquired MRSA in Hawaii. And usually the cases in the community are much higher, and they're not usually reported because then, first of all, it's kind of hard to. It's not that it's hard to get treatment. It's just that most of the time, by the time you realize oh you have MRSA, the symptoms are, have already kicked in, and you're probably already near death. And more specifically, no one has ever looked at MRSA in Hawaii schools. And due to no research, we actually have no idea if schools in Hawaii are spreading MRSA. And by knowing the level of MRSA in schools, we can, it will help the government and the school take action to clean those specific surfaces or areas to keep people from getting sick. And also, any like mention of an outbreak or disease, especially in Hawaii, that relies so heavily on like tourism, will scare away people to coming, which will slow down the economy. And with all the information, I came to the research question of what is the level of MRSA in Oahu schools, even though during the summer I only sampled the Alani school due to time constraints and the fact that like during the summertime a lot of schools, like public schools, which I wanted to sample, were closed. And with that question, I set out to conduct an experiment to find the answer to the question. So first step was to sample the school surfaces. So first I would get a sterilized swab and swab the most commonly used surfaces. An example of one site that I one surface that I used was shown on the right. So this is the like um, water fountain near the lowest near the main office in the I wing. And I basically swabbed like swab each each handle and then I plated I plated each I inoculated the immersive hardy chrome agar with the swab, so each surface, like each handle, got its own separate plate. And in total, I swabbed 25 surfaces. And then after, you would come back into the lab and then incubate the plates for 24 hours, uh, plus or minus 4 hours, but most of the time, it's just 24 hours. And then you would look for growth. So, the plate that's in the middle there that has none. That is an example of a plate that would have no growth after 24 hours. And on the picture on the on my on your right, my left, shows that so that there's a lot of like colonies. However, when you do look for growth, you also have to look at the chart that I provided on like on your left. It says interpretation of results. And basically if you see that the colonies are not pink or magenta, then you could say that it's not MRSA. But then again, but then the question then arises, what is actually these antibiotic resistant bacteria? Because only antibiotic resistant bacteria can grow on these plates. It's meant only for that. But but if there are no observable colony growth on the plates, like on the first example that I showed with a plate with no with no colonies, then you put the plates back into the incubator for another twenty four hours and then check for growth again using the same chart. And after 48 hours, if you see that like there is no growth at all, you can just say that, oh, this site is negative. There's nothing. There's no MRSA here. But if there is observable colony on plates, then you have two options. The first option is to incubate the plate for another 24 hours 
because sometimes you want to see if there's more, like, if there's more samples that can grow, more colonies for you to grab for the, the DNA to help your, like, data sampling and everything else. Or you can just immediately extract DNA and run PCR and gel electrophoresis. So both ways you do have to run the PCR and gel electrophoresis, but one of them, you're just trying to get more samples first. Um, and in my results, I found that there was there's a lot of um, anti anti uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in the water fountain near the main office in the eye wing. Though none of these are Mercer because on when I sampled the plates, they were all colorless. But I was able to find a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria in the water fountain near the lower gym and pool and the eye wing bathroom handles. And, and to conclude, so even though that there was no MRSA detected in my samples, I found a lot of other antibiotic resistant bacteria in my samples. And I, I will, and I need to run G, um, PCRs and gel electrophoresis and sequencing to find out exactly what those samples are, because they're clearly not MRSA, as shown by the blades. And that also goes into my further research, which is, you know, after I would PCR a gel electrophoresis, then I will go and sample other schools to get, you know, a more collective idea of like what's the level of MRSA in Oahu schools, and then resample Iolani at a different point in time because I I sampled over the summer and you know the population is different between the summer than to regular school. Um, I learned that starting your research in the summer is very important because it gives you the time and time and chance to experiment with different protocols, like. Basically, I started trying to like look at like these charter schools that were because I have some papers that were saying that oh this this type of school would give you this type of school or this type of population demographic has a high chance of getting MRSA. But then you have to look back and be like, you know, I don't think this is actually like ethnically allowed. Like it might be a little bit of targeting. So it gives you time to like look at it and see hmm maybe this is not the right way to go around my project. And this will also help you start the year with a clear protocol and you won't have to spend the time crafting a protocol that could or could not work in the second quarter. And again, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Chan for mentoring me and the John and Violet K Fellowship for, for the opportunity that they gave all of us and to my mom, dad, and brother for, for um, driving me around in all the places during the summer. Uh, and that's all. Thank you.